Chapter Three of the Yellow Sheet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yellow Sheet, the LibriVox Nano Rimo Project, two thousand seven. Chapter Three, written and recorded by Gesine. What did she say? To know deck or something. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, can you hear me? Liz opened her eyes. Derek, she said clearly, wonderingly. She looked up slightly, took in the concerned faces of the two nurses bent over her, and asked, annoyance now in her voice, "Where is the bastard?" The doctors were walking quickly, in that purposeful. Every second counts, and lives could be lost. Way medical staff at hospital often exhibits. The patient is delusional, believes an atomic bomb has been dumped in some lake in Montana, and that she was running from the fallout. Also talks about having to protect something in that duffel bag she had with her, but all the bag contains is a couple of pebbles. She remembers her husband Derek. He is with her now, but she thinks he has run off to the Himalayas with a school teacher, and she last saw him parachuting off a cliff. Tox screen, clean. Whatever is causing this, it's not drugs. We should MRI the brain. Do it and talk to the husband. Find out if there's any history of psychosis or if she's bumped her head recently. On the other side of the river, Bruce Stiefer, Glen Professor for Nuclear Physics, walked across Lewitt's bold floor art bars of colors within squares. The department's new atrium building, the Green Center for Physics. Had officially opened only a month ago, and Dyfer was still getting used to the new interconnectedness the structure was supposed to foster, not to mention the new colors. He reached his office, successfully avoiding a group of first-year undergraduates, and sat with a sigh behind his desk, a mahogany monster much too large for the size of the room. The desk was empty, but for the mail. Dyfer booted up his computer and started sorting through the pile of faculty memos. Journals, letters, and student papers. He wrote a quick reply on one of the memos, read and threw out a couple others, and finally came to a letter that hadn't been opened by his secretary. On the envelope, the words "Professor Bruce Dyfer, Physics, MIT," were neatly printed in black ballpoint pen. In one corner, in red and underlined, "Personal." Dyfer frowned and took a Swiss Army knife out of his pocket. He selected a slim blade. And carefully, with great precision, sliced open the envelope. He used the cuff of his shirt to wipe the microscopic traces of paper dust off the knife, and returned it to his pocket. The letter comprised of a single small sheet of yellow writing paper. On it, printed in the same neat black ballpoint, there were two words, and nothing else. Had professional detachment allowed it, Dr. Friedman would have felt sorry for Derek McKenna. The man was visibly shaken. I just don't understand it. She describes everything in such detail: her house in Montana, the mountain trail, the mushroom cloud, the two women. She is worried about her horse. Her horse. She won't even let the children have a hamster. And your wife has shown no signs of, of anything going on prior to this. Has she made any changes lately, or has she been away? No, nothing like that. She is very efficient. The kids, shopping, the house, social activities. She runs it all like clockwork. We have a big plan on our kitchen wall with everyone's schedule for the week, and everything was normal until about ten o'clock Thursday morning, when Liz didn't show up at her book club meeting. Doctor Friedman nodded, but she was admitted here only at twelve p.m. Do you know what she did in these two to three hours? I found out today. Yesterday I went through Liz's clothes to take them home to wash, and noticed that she had new shoes I'd never seen before, for hiking or something. I've been round all the big outdoor stores downtown, and one of the sales assistants recognized Liz when I showed him a photo. She bought the shoes on Thursday morning. He remembers because it's the day he goes to the climbing wall, and they had a chat about climbing and trail running. She tried on a few pairs and chose these, Merrells, he says they are. He says it's one of the best brands. Derek ran a tired hand across his chin, 
upon which uncharacteristic stubble was forming. Thing is, she's not into outdoor sports at all, and she's never been climbing. So why did you buy the shoes? Dr. Friedman leaned forward, interested at last. Maybe she was planning a holiday? Or a surprise? Or maybe she wanted to take it up? She doesn't like the outdoors. She goes to the gym. We have one in our basement. Machines are more efficient, you see. She can exercise there every day, whatever the weather outside, and she can measure her workout intensity and everything. But John, this sales guy, he says she really knew her stuff. He asked me if I ran trail too and where we go climbing. Perhaps she wanted to try something different. Perhaps she didn't want to tell you until she'd mastered a new skill. Or maybe she didn't want to worry you. Derek sighed. But that's just it. Liz hates change. She likes routine. It makes her feel safe. She wouldn't just take up a new hobby without reason, out of the blue. And we still don't know why she suddenly ran down this street screaming, and why she's saying all these things now. I mean, she's never even been to Montana. And I... Do I look like a mountaineer to you, or as if I know one end of a parachute from the other? No, the doctor thought. He had a heavily built frame and appeared to be reasonably fit. But he was also dressed entirely in dark brown clothes, and this made him look more like a monk than someone into extreme sports. But the worst thing is, Derek's voice broke along with his emotional dam, that she doesn't remember we have children. I'm sorry, Mr. McKenna. The only thing I can tell you is that your wife's symptoms don't seem to be physical. We've run a complete set of tests, and everything has come back normal. As far as we can tell, your wife is physically healthy. I'm transferring her to the psychiatry ward for further assessment. Derek's shoulders slumped. Jennifer blinked slowly as awareness set in. The hand moved from her knee to the inside of her thigh, travelling higher slowly but steadily. She closed her eyes again, giving herself up to the sensation of that touch, experiencing just it, ignoring everything else. She sighed contentedly as the hand continued to stroke. She spread her legs a little to allow easier access. The hand slipped under the elastic of her panties. The alarm went off. "'Damn!' Jennifer swore. "'Hang on, don't stop!' She rolled over, the hand moving with her, and stretched an arm out to the alarm clock, which increased its volume with every second beep. "'God, I hate this thing, and I can't reach!' She moved up, causing the hand to slip deeper down. "'Hmm. There!' The beeps stopped. So did the stroking. What's wrong? That clock is a mood killer. And we have to get up, Alice said mournfully. She propped herself up on one elbow and smiled down on her partner. But early shift today, so we'll have the whole evening to play. She lowered her head and kissed Jennifer's pouting lips. Promise? Jennifer asked, wrapping a leg around Alice's hips. Professor Dyfer slowly put down the letter. He took his glasses off and started polishing them, his brows creased, his eyes staring ahead. Finally he put the glasses back on and took up the telephone, dialing a number from memory. "'It's Bruce,' he said. "'I got another one.' "'Just an empty sheet again?' the voice at the other end asked after a pause. "'No, the same paper and everything.' but this time there's a message. Well? Dyfer adjusted his glasses, adjusted them again, took them off. It says, We know. End of chapter 3